Hello, you're listening to a sermon from Community Church in Prague, Oklahoma. At Community Church, we are all about loving God as a community and loving people in our community. If you live in the area, we would love for you to join us on a Sunday morning for coffee and fellowship at 9.30 or for service at 10 a.m. And now here is our pastor, Wopsle, with part three of our series, Powerful. Today is week three of this powerful series, and, um, and we're, uh, today's about the Holy Spirit. Now, I, thought, I said this earlier, but if we're going to do a series on powerful, it seems funny to me to only do one week on the Holy Spirit. Like, the whole thing should be about the Holy Spirit, because that is powerful, and that is the whole reason why we are powerful. But for this particular series, we're just going to try to cover it today. I left a lot of stuff on the cutting room floor I like to would have said. Maybe in the fall we'll do a Holy Spirit series, but today we're going to do the best we can. Today is Pentecost Sunday, which Pentecost is an event that happens in your Bible. It's in Acts 2. We're going to get there in a minute and cover it. Um, But it's been really easy the first year of our church because this is our first Pentecost Sunday. So guess what? We're just preaching Acts 2 Pentecost, like, because we've never done it before, right? So everything's been really easy. For Easter, like, we just preached the resurrection, right? For Christmas, it was just like, just Luke 2. Let's just preach the most obvious one. Now, this, this year at Christmas... It's not going to be so easy. We're going to have to get a little bit more creative, right? But for this year, everything's just our first one. So guess what? On Pentecost Sunday, we're just preaching about Pentecost from Acts 2. It should be pretty simple. Um, next year, if I get up here and I'm just like, I don't know, y'all. There's no other Pentecost in the Bible. Well, forgive me for then. But for the first year, it has been really easy. So again, to kind of get us all on the same page, you may be very familiar with Pentecost. You may have known today is Pentecost Sunday, or this may be the first time you've ever heard that word. So let me give you a brief overview of what it means today is Pentecost Sunday. Sunday. So Pentecost was, a, was an event in biblical times that the Israelites did. It was also called the Feast of the Harvest sometimes. It's called Pentecost because, pretty simple, it was 50 days after Passover. So for, for Passover for the Israelites is close to Easter for us, so those kind of things sort of overlap, right? So for them it was 50 days after the Passover, uh, then they would have this fest, Feast of the Harvest. They kind of planted at the start of Passover, so 50 days later. It's just called Pentecost because penta means 50. It's not some kind of weird spiritual meaning. It's just a number that went along with how many days it was. It was also called the Feast of Weeks because it was a week of weeks. You get that? Seven weeks, so seven times seven is 49. So after that seven times seven, the 50th day, was Pentecost, and they would do this big festival. So it was a, a first fruits of the harvest kind of deal, a big celebration of all, of kind of, of having food and stuff at the first harvest season. So it's significant today for, for reasons that we'll discover. That's what we're going to do here today. But back then, they also then took this Feast of Weeks or this Pentecost Day to celebrate the idea that God gave them the Torah. Now, a lot of terminology here. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible. Okay, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, those ones that, you know, you start in Genesis and then skip over by about February 1st, right? Um, that's what the, the, the this celebration was, God giving the people of God the Torah. So it was a celebration of the word of God, literally, back then. So it was on this day of celebration, 50 days after Jesus had died and resurrected, that the Holy Spirit came at this event of Pentecost. So they were together because it was Pentecost, which was just this festival already. That's why they were all together doing the same thing, praying together and worshiping together. But then that's just so happens to be whenever the Holy Spirit showed up. So today when we talk about Pentecost, we talk about the Holy Spirit showing up and moving in power. You may have heard a church out there called, there's a Pentecostal church, right? If you know something about them, it usually means a church that's a little bit more lively, a little bit more open to the Holy Spirit kind of, you know, doing some stuff, people kind of running up and down the aisles. And a few things that I would welcome, if you feel like the Holy Spirit's moving you, I, I, I would like a little bit more lively. We're clapping, we're getting good at that, but whatever else the Lord leads you to do, um, as long as he's actually leading you to do it, then I, I trust you. So we're going to be in Acts 2 today, but like we always do, we're going to go back and lay some foundation in Acts 1 to get to this Pentecost. It's going to be really great. So if you're following along, you want to go back to Acts 1. We're going to start in chapter 4 after some introductions um, that Luke did. Luke wrote this, and this is he's talking now um, about looking back on the time leading up to Pentecost. So verse 4, it starts with this. On one occasion, now this one occasion just happens to be 40 days after Passover. So 
Passover happens. 40 days later, Jesus is saying something now. He's going to be gone for 10 days, and then Pentecost happens. None of this is going to be on a test later. Don't worry. But this is just something helpful to kind of couch what's going on here. What is Jesus thinking about? So on this one occasion, 40 days after this, or for our purposes here, 10 days before Pentecost, um, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Right? He'd been talking about the Holy Spirit this whole time. He'd been saying before things like, it's better for me to go away because a comforter is going to come in, right? Jesus was saying, talking about the Holy Spirit a whole lot, but they didn't know what he was talking about. So here he says, I've been talking about this the whole time. It's finally about to happen. So verse 6, then they gathered around him, the disciples did, and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Like we've been following you thinking this whole time, you're the one that's going to fix stuff. You're going to take the throne. You're going to lead us in victory. Are you finally going to do the stuff we've been thinking you're going to do? They didn't realize that's what he did on the cross, right? They're still wrestling with that. So verse 7, he says this. He said, it is, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set up by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. See, right, right there, real quick, he, they say, hey, you told us that this power is gonna come. Do you mean with this power then is when you're gonna do the thing that we're waiting for you to do? Is this when Israel is gonna be restored to its rightful power? And he basically says, hey, what God is doing in the big picture is actually not of your concern. What I'm asking you to do is to be obedient with what I just told you to do, to wait for a little bit, and then when the Holy Spirit comes to go be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So I think sometimes for me, this can be pretty convicting whenever God says, hey, Wopsle, I need you to do this little thing. I'm like, oh, God, I see. Because when I do this little thing, you're going to do this, 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 and this. He's like, hey, I'm not... That's, that's not what this is about, man. Like, calm down, be obedient with what I'm asking you to do, and I'll be faithful with the big picture stuff that I'm trying to do. Right? This is more about what you're doing than it is about how long it's going to take or what God's going to do. Be faithful with what God says. That's what he invites the disciples here to do. And then verse 9, this is pretty cool. It says, after he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. He's gone now. Verse 10, they were looking intently up at the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. We've come to believe these are probably angels. Verse 11 says, men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is one of those parts of the Bible that I think is kind of funny because Jesus is very clear. He says, hey, you guys, don't go anywhere. Stay here in Jerusalem. And then he goes into heaven. They're like, wow. And immediately these two angels show up and they're like, what are you doing just standing here? Get going, go, go, go. It's time to go. Jesus is gonna come back. We gotta go. And they're like, wait, we do, do I go? Do I stay? What am I supposed to be, you know, not, who am I supposed to be obeying here? Jesus or this angel that's right here? It seems like they're kind of getting mixed messages to me anyway. But, but I don't think that they are, obviously. I think that, I think here's what, what we're learning from this is, is that they have to wait Jesus said to wait, guess what? They need to wait. But they also have some work to do because this Holy Spirit that's coming is so much more powerful than they have any idea about, way much more than they've ever experienced it before. In fact, they saw the Holy Spirit working in Jesus in, you know, in, in localized, but the Holy Spirit's about to spread in everybody and like do this huge thing. They have no idea what's coming. So they both have to wait and they also have to get acting and get preparing. It kind of reminds me, some of you may remember this about me. In high school and a few years after, I was a, I was a worship leader kind of guy. I traveled around with bands and led worship, did tons of Falls Creek, stuff like that. Um, and there was this camp that, that I liked a whole lot that I felt like uh, one time, I was about 19 or 20, that God told me um, that I was going to lead worship at this camp. Not like, like, he was like, I needed to prepare myself to be ready to lead worship at this camp that a bunch of us knew about. That we like, it was called Dayspring. Some of you may know it. And so um, I was like, okay, God, that's pretty cool. Um, I, I, I can't, I'm not good enough. I can't do that right now. Like, I've never done that before. But if you want me to do that, okay, that's good. I even told some of my friends. And you know what my friends told me? 
no, man, like you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. You're not good enough. That, no, you're not the guy that can do that. And they were right. I wasn't the kind of guy that could do that. But I wasn't a week away from doing it. I was two years away from doing it. So guess what I did? I said, I'm not just going to wait for that two years to come and then at that time be like, okay, I'm here to lead worship. God told me to do this. No, what I did is I worked really hard. I could play guitar, but I wasn't good at it. So I got a lot better at the guitar. I bought some pedals and some things that made my guitar sound better where I could plug into better stuff. Um, I, I had a band that played, but uh, the, they, they kind of dispersed, so I had to get new and new bandmates together. I, it took me a long time, and I worked really, really hard. And guess what happened at the end of that two years? I, it'd be a funnier story if God was like, never mind, just like, but no, I actually did end up leading worship at Dayspring, and I was like, I didn't feel like I was some like triumphant guy crossing the finish line. I just felt like I was a faithful guy that God said, hey, Wopsle, I've got this for you, but you're not ready yet. So you've got a long waiting period till you do this thing. That means it's, it's a gift that God gave me to prepare to be ready to take the blessing that he had for me at the end of that time. So what I'm telling you is this, is if God is telling you something like Jesus did the disciples here, that, hey, wait, because there's this incredible blessing that I've got for you that's going to be far beyond your wildest imagination. If God is telling you that, don't just twiddle your thumbs and, and wait passively, but wait actively because the blessing he has for you may, you may not be ready for today. Give you some specific examples here. Maybe it's for a spouse. You know God has a spouse for you and you've been waiting. You could just wait around and be like, I don't know, I hope somebody comes sweep me off their feet. I can't wait for love at first sight. It's gonna be great. Or you could focus however long you have to be waiting to becoming the spouse that you need to be to be married, right? You maybe same thing with children. You've been waiting and you know that God's promised you, God can tell you, you know that that's gonna happen for you and you're waiting for whatever reason. Maybe you're waiting on purpose. Maybe you're waiting against your own will. But maybe God has given you this time. Yes, you know this promise is coming. Don't just sit around and passively wait, but actively work on becoming the kind of parent that you want to be when the blessing is fulfilled. Maybe with money, right? God, I know you're going to give me a lot of money someday, but right now I'm broke. Well, you and I both know, mo money, mo problems, right? Like that is like basically, I think in here somewhere in these pages, um, if, if God, here's what I know about me. I'll just speak for myself. I'm not speaking for you. If God snapped his fingers and gave me millions of dollars today, it would be bad news. It's like cocaine by Tuesday probably, right? Like I am not to be trusted with this money that I don't know how to do anything with. I've got a lot of work in my heart. to. It's not, not really cocaine. It'd be much softer drugs than that. But um, I just say, I would be driving like a Tesla truck, right? Which is like notoriously not good right now. But like I would not be wise with it. So maybe that's why God hasn't given me any money yet. I don't know. But if for some reason you feel like God wants me to be successful financially, that's awesome. And I pray that for you. Don't forget, tithing's about 10% would be great for you to recall that at that time. But if God's gonna bless you with that, that's awesome. And God absolutely does that a lot of times. Then, but you're waiting for that? Don't just say, boy, all my problems will be fixed the day I get money. Instead say, God, if you have that blessing for me, Prepare me in my heart now so that when I receive that, I can do with it what you would have me to do and stay off drugs. Lord, please be patient in your waiting. I, of course, I didn't make this up, but, um, but some version of this you've probably heard before that, that we should wait like what it is that we want is coming in 10 years and we should work like it's coming tomorrow, right? Prepare as hard as we can. Wait as actively as we can knowing that it may be a long time. But still, be patient in your waiting, be diligent in your working. So now it's finally time for the actual sermon today, okay? We're gonna get on to Acts 2, uh, which is when Pentecost happens. So if you'll turn there, if you wanna turn there, it'll be on the screen, of course. Verse one says this, when the day of Pentecost came, right? We're finally there. They were all together in one place. Again, they, weren't there, they were there together in one place because they were having this feast of weeks, this big party already. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Okay, these little four verses here are all we're gonna talk about today. So first off, let's talk about where that one ended, tongues. Because I think there's two kinds of people in here, right? The first type is this. 
finally. I've been waiting for Waffle to talk about tongues forever. I've been locked and loaded. I'm ready. Let's light it up in here. Let's go. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You've been in services where it's kind of it's wild, and you're like, finally, this is the day. And there's some of you in here that have never sweat so much in church in your life as when the pastor started talking about tongues. You're like, Waffle, I thought that this was a safe place where I came, where I knew what to expect. Now you're going to start talking about tongues. I didn't think that that's what kind of church that we were. Well, first of all, everybody settle down. Um, Tongues is not the purpose of the sermon today. I think it's a worthwhile topic. It's a conversation I would love to have. Probably a sermon I will preach at some time. But there's, like I said, there's a lot of stuff on the cutting room floor. We've got too much to cover today to focus a lot of time on tongues. Here's all I will say about it is, it's my understanding of how I read my Bible, that the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, nothing significant has changed between that day and now in the life of the church. Life looks a little bit different. But, but God's the same. We are still on the same mission that he just gave his disciples in Acts 1. We're still supposed to be going into all the earth, preaching in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the earth, all that kind of stuff. So um, if, if I read in Acts 2 that the Holy Spirit empowers people to do something, it's my belief that today the Holy Spirit can empower people just the same to do something. And if you want to know, I know, uh, you know, I've heard of preachers I've been a part of sermons, services where uh, people spoke in tongues and it was very edifying. And to God, I've seen people speak in tongues and people uh, interpret it in a way that was prophecy over the church that was edifying. And I've been a part of stuff where I'm like, I don't think this is right, where people are just doing things. And I'm saying, this doesn't seem to be line up with the tongues I understand in the Bible. So is there a misunderstanding? Absolutely. Are we going to fix it all and cover it all today? Well, actually not. Not because I'm afraid, but because I think I really want to focus on the other parts first. We'll get back to tongues later. If you'd like to have a conversation, well, then you buy the coffee and I'll be there. So let's back up to Acts 2, verse 2, and look at these things, that, the other things that we see, right? So tongues is, is kind of such a hot button issue. Sometimes we can read Acts 2, 1 through 4, and all we think about is, well, then tongues, right? Like, oh no, that, what are we going to do? But a lot of other cool stuff happens here that we are going to really lean into. Verse 2 said, suddenly a sound like a blowing and violent wind came, filled the whole house. This word there of wind is used all throughout the Bible through the Old and the New Testament. And it's always kind of used to, to simultaneously mean these three things, to be wind often, but also breath and also spirit. So it's the spirit came like a spirit. Well, yeah, of course it did. But that wind and breath and spirit are the same words used in, di- the same word, but used in different contexts. For example, the wind hovering above the waters in Genesis 1. It's the same word. It's the breath blowing life into creation in Genesis 2, right? It's breath, it's spirit going into Adam. In Ezekiel, it's when the wind is moving over the dry bones, bringing them back to life. In John, it actually says Jesus breathed on them, his disciples, and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And the the Son of God breathing on his disciples is what gave them the Spirit. It's interesting, too, that they heard a sound and they felt a wind. You know, I think that's cool and interesting. Because those are two things that you can't see and you can't touch, but you know that they're there. They're undeniable. Wind and sound. The word the Old Testament used here is called ruach. Then a cool, tough sounding name, the ruach of God. The New Testament in Greek, it calls it pneuma the pneuma. But it all means the same thing. It all means spirit and breath and wind, all simultaneously and all on purpose. Because this pneuma, this ruach, this wind, this breath, this spirit, it's the spirit of God that is inside of us. It's it's, it's the God that lives inside of us is this breath spirit. So whenever God gave the Israelites his name back in the Old Testament, That's whenever he gave them the word that we kind of know now as Yahweh, right? You've probably heard that or seen that somewhere. Um, In your Bible, anytime the Lord is capitalized, all caps, capital L-O-R-D, it's not a ton, but in the Old Testament it is. Um, Anytime you see that, it's actually the Yahweh. It's like the name of God, not just like a Lord, like the normal Lord. So he gave them this word Yahweh. Now in Hebrew, which is what this was given in, and there are no vowels, which like I'm a bad speller as it is, but at least I know every word's got a vowel in it. Take away vowels, I'd be even worse. So this Yahweh, as we know it, it was actually just Y-H-W-H. We like to put some, some word to it, so some weight to it so we can say it easier. But Yahweh and Y-H-W-H are actually a little bit different, aren't they? If, if you were trying to say 
the word YH. I think it might sound something like, yeah. Right? There's not enough vowels. There's, not, there's nothing to it. And then WH, something more like, Wah. right? It, it, it's subtle. It's quiet. These words, you don't touch your lips together. You don't touch your tongue. As there's just kind of not a lot happening in the mouth with, fact it's just breath isn't it the name that God gave his people back then he didn't say hey my name is Bill from now on that's what you call me I've got a nameplate on my desk no he said my name is breathing being alive being in my presence being in the presence of other people living life And at the risk of sounding a little bit like Darth Vader up here, trying to show you what it's like, I think you can hear, you can see. His name isn't a name at all. It's a, it's a spirit. It's a breath. It's, it's in you. And, and I think one reason, one of the, there are many reasons why this is important for us today, but I think one reason I want to highlight is because we all breathe the same. There's no Baptist, Methodist, or Pentecostal way of breathing we're all just breathing, right? There's no American or African or Australian way. There's no white, black, or Native American way of breathing. We're all just breathing the same. There's no rich way or poor way. Everyone breathes in and out. And there's not really much of a difference between people breathing and animals even breathing, right? Everything breathes in and breathes out that's alive. The only time... Uh, yeah, sorry, in Psalm 50, did I put Psalm 150, verse six in there? Um, think about, it. we breathe and animals breathe and all these different things breathe and God said his name is breath and Psalm 50, which is a psalm full of praises to God and lifting him up and talking about how great he is and the wonders he's done and all this, Psalm 50 is the last psalm in your Bible. Verse six is the last verse of the last psalm in this entire long book of giving praise to God. And look at the very last sentence. It says, let everything that has breath praise God. The Lord. Because that's his name. Because that's who he is. If something has breath, it can give glory to God. If something has breath, it does give glory to God. Whether you like it or not, you've been praying since the start of this sermon. If you've been breathing except for that moment when I talked about tongues. Some of y'all stopped for a second there, but other than that, your first breath on this earth was a prayer and your last breath will be too. So the fact that God shows up as a wind, as a breath, as a spirit, makes total sense. It's totally in line with who he is from Genesis 1 to Verse two, the spirit above the waters. Through all the Old Testament, we see him showing up in the breath and in the wind and then the whispers, all those kinds of things, right? So obviously now in Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit is coming, he shows up as a wind, as a breath. Because that's who he is and what he has done since the beginning. And the other thing we see in verse three then is that he shows up as fire. It says fire um, descended on them and you know, stayed on them. We don't really know what that means. Usually it's depicted as a flame above their head. So everyone looks like the candle from uh, Beauty and the Beast. You know, I don't know if that's what it looked like. I kind of think it may have been more like on the heart, which how does a fire on your heart look? I don't know. But Moses had a bush that was burning and it wasn't burning up. So God gets to do weird things with fire if he chooses, right? I don't know. But we know that throughout the Old Testament, we see God and fire are closely linked. Again, Moses in this bush in Exodus 3, God calls Moses to do something crazy through the fire of this bush. Then whenever Moses is leading them out, it says it leads them with a cloud of smoke in the day, but at night, smoke isn't very visible. So it's a pillar of fire. It's this tornado of fire at night. If I was gonna be anything as God, I would be a tornado fire, a fire tornado. That's pretty cool. That's in Exodus 13. Elijah and the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18, you may remember this, the prophets of Baal are like, our God's pretty cool. And they're trying to get, the, get their God to make this altar on fire and they can't do it. So then Elijah gets and he puts all this water on there and he's like, makes it really, really hard. And he just says a simple prayer. 
God, show up in fire. And boom, this fire comes and lifts up everything. The offering's gone. The wood's gone. Like it just it, uh, d- decimates the thing. God shows up in this powerful fire. The New Testament in Hebrews, it says that God is a consuming fire, right? Not in a way like a wildfire that's like your house is in danger, not that kind of thing, but a consuming fire in a way it like comes into our hearts and descends to, onto us and then takes over and, and changes everything. And it's powerful and it's it's terrifying in all the best kind of ways. So God shows up as, as a breath, as a wind. God shows up in this, in this fire, in this moment, the first time that the Holy Spirit is here. Sometimes I think that we in the church, we can treat the Holy Spirit sort of as a lesser part of God, right? God, okay, we love that. He's on the throne. He's got a big, cool white beard. He's great. He's in the clouds. Um, Jesus, yeah, we like him too, right? He's got a, a brown beard, but it's a beard, a beard nonetheless. And so he can hang out. We love him. But then the Holy Spirit, no beard, right? Like we don't know if we can trust him. Well, I feel like we kind of think God and Jesus make sense. And then Holy Spirit is kind of this, this lesser one. But listen, this is important for us to know. The Holy Spirit is just as much God as Jesus is God. And we've got to reorient our mind around that just a little bit. God is this wind and this breath. God is a consuming fire. And here the Holy Spirit shows up showing himself as those things and then coming and living inside of us. So we've got this God the Father that made us. We've got Jesus that saved us. Now it's the Holy Spirit that is God in us and what makes us powerful today. So kind of back to this day of Pentecost what happens next, right? The, the, the shows up, there's people speaking in tongues, there's fire, there's wind, all kinds of stuff. What is going on here? Well, I'm gonna summarize the rest of Acts 2 really quick. I encourage you to go back and read it later if you would like. Um, but whenever they're speaking in tongues, it says people from all over the world, you remember a lot of people were in town for this festival, right? So a lot of people from all over the place were in town. It says people from all over the world could hear them speaking in their own language. So they're like, hey, I'm from out of town, but they're speaking my language in here. And they're kind of, what's going on in there? And they hear people praising God and they're speaking in the languages that the people can hear. And it's, it's a really a Holy Spirit moment. Um, and then one of the guys even says, oh, they're just drunk. And I love Peter stands up. He says, they're not drunk. It's only nine in the morning. It's not, it's not Kolachi, right? Like this is a day when 9 a.m. drunkness would be strange. So no, they're not drunk yet. And then Peter goes on to preach the first Holy Spirit-empowered sermon, other than Jesus preaching, but the first time a person stood up and preached with the Holy Spirit, and at the end of that sermon, 3,000 people said yes to following Jesus. Amen, right? That's a, that's a sermon right there, man. We might get to that today. We'll be close. Um, and then at the end, so then it go, the, the, the whole sermon is lined out in Acts 2. It's beautiful. And at the end, it talks about the church, and it says, going on from that day, it says, people were added daily, to their number. Every single day, people that were around these disciples and these apostles and these 3,000 people that were filled with the Holy Spirit, people couldn't be around them without following Jesus. And so now my hope, my prayer, the, the plan is that we are a Holy Spirit filled people. It doesn't have to get weird. It doesn't mean that you're in your yard doing something crazy, right? David danced naked before the Lord. Don't do that. I don't think the Holy Spirit's doing that in your life today, these days. But it means that whenever we're around people, the, the fruits of the Spirit are so evident in our lives and they're not produced because we're good people that can be loving. No, I have a hard time with that. But the Holy Spirit comes in, in me and lives in me and produces that fruit in me so that people cannot be hopefully the plan is people cannot spend time around me without leaving saying, man, God is good. My prayer often, a lot of times when we pray before service is say, I don't want anyone to leave here saying, hey, that Wapsle guy is pretty cool because I'm not. I want people to leave here saying, God is good and he loves me. He's got a plan for me. And I can only do that if any of us can only do that if the Holy Spirit's the one speaking through us. Kind of one thing on that note, do you know how many times people come up to me and they say, they really mean it. Your sermon seemed to be directed at me. Like you said a few things that I think you meant, like you were talking about me and they were kind of offended by it. It's like, I don't know what's going on in most of your lives. Um, I mean, I'm happy to know, let me know, especially if you're buying the coffee. But, um, 
but the Holy Spirit, if I'm diligent in preparing and if I'm up here hopefully relying on the Holy Spirit, then he gets to take the things between what I'm saying and what you're experiencing, what the Holy Spirit's doing in the room, and he gets to make it feel like it was personal. Just like at Pentecost, it felt like it was personal to all these people. They could hear it in their own language. If you're hearing something that's for you, it's the Holy Spirit doing that. So let's wrap up with this. Pentecost, what was this moment back then, right? But, but it's not just a thing for back then because we can kind of get it like this, the cross. Jesus died on a cross. That was a thing that happened in one moment in time, but it still affects us today, right? Like we still wear cross necklaces. Like we are all about the cross. We say thank you for the cross in, in, in these songs that we sing. We, we don't say Jesus rose. We say Jesus is risen, right? So it's like that was a moment but yet it was not really just a thing that happened. It was a, like a starting point for everything, right? I think Pentecost is the same thing. We don't just look back and say, it's cool that God did that, but he's not doing anything today because of that. Pentecost wasn't just a moment back then. It was a starting pistol. It was the moment that the mission of the church was delivered and it has been going ever since and we're still on it today. Now, if it's a starting pistol, admittedly, I will admit that the most exciting part of a race is the first one second. And the last one second. Everything in between is just kind of waiting for that last second, right? Kind of like a basketball game. I don't watch basketball until the last few minutes because it's always the same, right? There's like a whole bunch of stuff that happens and then the last little bit, it comes down to the last shot. I love that last shot. I don't always watch the rest of the time. So if Pentecost was a starting pistol, that day was really exciting. And guess what? Someday Jesus is going to come back. That day is going to be really, really exciting too. And we're in the middle of this race. It's a very long race. And you may feel like, I don't know, it's not as exciting right now. Well, I think that that's true of any race. But we're running this race anyway. It's not about, God, when are you going to come? What's the time frame? Give me the big picture. It's about us being obedient with what God has given us today, knowing that he's going to work in us to further his kingdom until the race is over. We're running this race, we're running with Holy Spirit power. And what I think is cool is what happens when you run harder? You breathe harder, don't you? Hopefully. You're like, I don't know, I haven't done it in too long. So we'll let me remind you, when you run harder, you breathe harder. When we're running this race that God has called us to, this Holy, Spower, Holy Spirit empowered race, the one that changes the world around us, the one that people hanging out with us can't help but be drawn to God. When we're running that race and we're running it hard, then we breathe harder, which just means that we pray harder, right? This big breath, yah, way, we're bent over it, like, oh, oh, I'm so tired from running this race so diligently to the glory of God. We have the breath of God and the spirit of God in our chest. Every day while you're sleeping, you're praying. As soon as your eyes wake up in the morning, you're praying. And the harder you work and the harder you run, the harder you're praying that God come in and do something powerful through you. So friends, when we think about Pentecost Sunday, let's remember this isn't just some moment that happened that was kind of cool and weird back then. But that was the start of what God is doing in our lives right now. What God is doing in this church right now. Without the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't be celebrating here in a couple of weeks all that God's done in a year. It's been a wild thing that no one could have dreamt up. I think I mentioned this. Someone just told me a couple of weeks ago. Also, I thought you were doing the wrong thing. I, th I thought you were stupid. I thought you weren't. And I was like, hey, me too, man. We're on the, same, on the same page. But the Holy Spirit gets to do crazy things if we'll allow him to. So... It wasn't just a moment for back then, the Holy Spirit, Pentecost Sunday. The reason we talk about it today is not just to look back at Pentecost, but it's to be re reminded that today the Holy Spirit is, is working in our lives. And if we'll allow him to work in us, he will further his kingdom through us. Let me pray for us, church. God, we do thank you that you uh, have given us your breath, God, that the Holy Spirit lives in us and speaks to us and corrects us and directs us, God. We thank you that we cannot exist without praying your name. 
God. So as we do that, remind us that you are with us, that you are with everybody. These divisions that we've put up between us and other people, God, that we're all breathing the same. For people that have hurt us, God, that we are breathing your name just the same. For people that we don't know, for people that we've thought that we're better than, for people whose sin looks a little bit more differently than ours or happen to be more publicly, public than ours is, God, remind us that we all breathe your name the same. So God, come into our chest as a consuming fire that we could go out as Holy Spirit, powerful people to love this world the way that your son showed us how to do. God, we cannot do it on our own. We are much too selfish. But as we look to you and lean on you, God, help us to be someone who changes our communities and our teams and our workplaces and our neighborhoods and our families. God, lead us to be the powerful force led by your Holy Spirit. And it is in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray, amen.